Um, and I am going to uh, introduce our panel that is coming up. So uh, we have some really nice, comfortable chairs here for you all. So Mary Pittaway, Noni Wolf, and Lindsay Mullis. Um, Mary is a retired uh, nutrition and dietitian from Missoula Public Health, um, formerly Missoula City County Health Department, and is currently a Special Olympics uh, consultant. Is that, that the correct title? Yes, uh, Special Olympics Public Health Consultant, and is um, part of our uh, organizing committee for today and largely responsible for us even being here right now. Um, Noni uh, Wolf is from Fast Blackfeet, um, which, so I wanted to make sure I got this right, is a nonprofit fueled by dedicated community members, and it's on a mission to end food insecurity and uplift the Blackfeet Nation. And so Noni will uh, introduce herself uh, in greater depth when she gets up. And Lindsay Mullis, who I also wanted to make sure I got this right, is a program director for the University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute. Um, and it is our pleasure to have all three of them here this morning. So please join me in welcoming them. Thanks, Damien. So again, welcome to everybody and, and bravo that you came to this wonderful inclusive nutrition and health summit. It's a little bit different. It's not the, the grouping of people that we normally would see at a professional organization, but I like to think of you as the cream of the crop because you understand that health equity is what it's gonna take for us to move any of the needles that uh, assess public health or set, assess health in our nation. If we don't include groups that have health disparities, it pulls all the numbers down and it decreases our effectiveness at really causing sustainable change in our communities. So thank you for coming. This session, we're gonna talk about the federally funded food and nutrition programs. And we thought we'd be remiss if we didn't address this issue since it's a nutrition summit. And since for many people, the 17 federally funded programs are a mysterious hidden resource. And I'll be giving some information as we talk about how true that is for Montana, given that we have one of the lowest rates of utilization of the federally funded programs in the nation. And there's something we can do about it. And we're gonna talk about those that strategy today. So um, these federal federally funded programs are designed by our government and advocates and partners who put together ideas on how we can address nutrition and food insecurity. And the goal is to improve the health and well being of our nation. There's a dual goal, and that's to support our agriculture community. And I'll give a little history about how the, our programs, the programs for the United States started because they're rooted in issues that faced our farmers after the depression. And they're root, rooted also in issues related to having a, a solid workforce for our military. Uh, they have to do with fail, failure of some schools to produce good standardized test outcomes for students because oftentimes students would come to school hungry. And we can look at the different target groups that are served by the federal programs and understand if you, if you were ever interested, there's great history lessons online about how each of the different programs were started. So I'll be sharing this discussion with Noni Wolf who you just met, and she and I have worked together at, in public health for literally decades. I won't tell you how many because it defines my age, but let me tell you, it's from the very start. When the WIC program first got started in Montana was my first um, tiptoe into the waters of public health nutrition. And for any of you who do work in that field or if you work in public health, you probably know once you get started, there's no getting out because you feel good, to know that you've helped make the world a better place. And this talk today is going to give you some more strategies to further that agenda. So we're gonna talk about the 17 programs there, um, that are available to all Americans. And some are categorically uh, limited for eligibility, like the WIC program, pregnant women or infants. Um, others have age determinants 
and most of them have some kind of an income guideline. But in truth, all Americans are eligible if they're eligible. And we've, we know from data that about one in four Americans participates in a federally funded nutrition program every day. So many of you, we're going to find out just how many of you have actually had experience with those programs, but you'll be surprised at how, what an impact they have on our populations. So we'll get started. We've got some ideas to share with you, and you'll be hearing a more in-depth presentation from Lindsay Mullis, who will talk about exactly how um, successful adaptations for inclusion have have happened in public health programs. Chris introduced that idea to us, and so we've got the big picture, and Lindsay will help us zero in on what we could actually do or what's been shown to be effective. So we want uh, a phrase we're going to be using, we talk inclusion, but one of the topics that we also want to include is intentional inclusion, and that's a little bit different in that we don't just say, we have a program, everyone's welcome. And that, when I worked in public health, that was the motto, everybody's welcome. We'd like for people to rethink it, to say, not only is everyone welcome, everyone's specifically invited, the program is appropriate for all that we invite, and we'll have good health outcomes for those who participate, and we'll prove it. So it's taking it to the next level, and that's the challenge, because we can all learn the lingo, but to actually put it into place is it's going to take support. None, I don't think any of us can do public health and this level of public health on our own, but the bigger your network of partners, the more apt you are to be effective in it. So we're going to um, I'll learn how to use this thing. This is, this is an overview. I'm not going to read it to you because you can see it, and we're going to be speeding through here because we want to make sure we have time at the end to discuss some ideas you might have on how to be intentionally inclusive in the programs and services that you're actually involved in. We're not going to talk about community-based programs, community-based food programs today. And part of that is because we don't have time. But the other issue is that these vary, these differ from community to community. And so we could talk in general terms, but that's not going to be super helpful. We know that community-based programs like food banks and food pantries um, are part and parcel of the security safety net that we have in our country. But we're, we just won't talk about them today, but maybe at next year's summit that we hope to have in Helena, we will bring, we'll bring that contingent in. So, um, Let's move to now. In fact, Noni, I'll have you. Can you help me with that? So this initiative was reignited recently at the White House Conference for Nutrition, Hunger, Nutrition, and Health that was held in D.C. in September of 22. And this was the first time in 50 years that the White House or the government had pulled together advocates and experts in the fields of food food and nutrition and hunger to talk about what it, what we have in place, what's working, and where we need to go to actually provide services to all the people in our country that need them. There were about 200 agencies represented at this meeting, and it was an invitation conference, an invitation-only conference, because they wanted to have voices from the broad communities that serve in this space of uh, trying to alleviate hunger, to improve nutrition and health. And I, I'm gonna digress for a moment. The reason we have the words nutrition and hunger, and they're not just one word of food, there's plenty of food out there that doesn't promote health. And for oftentimes, at least in the past, that was what you saw when you went to food banks and food pantries. That's fortunately changed a lot in the past five years, where there's standards for what kinds of foods are accepted and how they're distributed. But the issue of nutrition, as opposed to this is not a, a dietitian acceptable word, but there's junk food and there's foods that promote health. And so we want not only to provide calories to that everybody needs, but those calories have to be with the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that will promote health. So I just wanted to throw that in because I'll be saying 
nutrition and food security, because those two have to go hand in hand. So at this conference, um, there were enough input from a variety of participants. They included nutrition and health advocates, um, university systems, local and state government and national government, and um, philanthropists. In fact, food companies and trade organizations were all involved too. Because when you, if you're talking about hunger, it's not just finding the food to give the people who need it. It takes the whole system of our country to be involved and supportive. And so I, I thought that the list of who was invited is just fantastic. Special Olympics was invited to represent the unmet health and nutrition needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. That's a long phrase. I'll say ID throughout from now on. So you because I, I stumble over those words myself. But that's what Special Olympics role was. And um, you'll see as we talk, as this summit unfolds, what a, a contribution this organization is making. Chris talked about our involvement in helping with the training to make diabetes prevention inclusive for people with IDD. And we'll be sharing resources. Special Olympics has a fine, um, e-learning, e almost a college of information on working with people with intellectual disabilities and how to make inclusion happen. And I'll give you those resources. They're all very professional and continuing ed credit oftentimes approved. But the sections on working with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is spectacular. I can't recommend it highly enough. So anyway, Special Olympics, one of the... Um, one of the solutions that they provided or that they came up with to move this agenda for people with ID was to host a summit in DC following the White House conference. And they invited 10 states and three Indian reservation representatives to come as delegations to develop grassroots programs that would further the, this initiative. Montana was chosen as one of those states, and actually the Blackfeet that Noni represents was the, uh, she was the head of another delegation that was funded, uh, that Special Olympics funded. And our chosen method was to begin hosting a summit such as this to bring in lots of the potential players in this field. And that's why you were invited. If you received an invitation, thank you for coming. We um, we were so surprised and so pleased with the variety of folks that are here today. And because we think together we can work on making all public health programs inclusive. So we have the 200 organizations. They coalesced into certain topic areas. And I want to show you... Um, an example of the kinds of work that the kind of work that each of the topic areas focused on. And I'll, I'll mention one more thing. Yes, we started this agenda through the White House, but everybody who's at this conference now, you are part of this new initiative. And just the fact that you're being here, and we hope that you'll have commitments to, to carry out the work we're proposing, um, shows that you'll be able to say that you're you're involved in the White House's agenda to improve nutrition and health. Okay, next slide. So these are some of the things that were a result of the meeting from those 200 agencies that were represented at the conference. And there, you could read through the list, I won't read them for you, but it at the end of the day, they came up with what the, the kinds of things that we've been working on, but what I loved about the list is that they put them into discrete goals. And they took this list to the next level then. It wasn't just a matter of defining what's wrong or what could be done. Each of the topic areas, so next, Noni. The, so groups would come up with their topics and then there, the assignment was they need to come up with a workable plan that will accomplish what their goal was. 
And a lot of times we go to meetings and we think, ah, oh, it's a great idea. I can't wait till I get home. And then your old life takes over and nothing really happens. Well, this group, when they agreed to come to the meeting, they agreed to follow through. So these are like five-year plans that are being developed. And this is an example of what the group that's focusing on eliminating hunger came up with. I'd like to call your attention to the very last one. And this one talks about, let's see if I can, I can't read it, it's too little, but it's making programs inclusive to serve people with IDD. And we talked about that. The idea of the first place is to make sure the program is accessible. Lindsay's gonna help with that. And, but we also want to consider how we target our advertisement and promotion. We worked in, um, I worked in diabetes prevention when it was first started here in Montana. And thank you for talking about the DPP program for us. That was a really good, quick overview of what happens. But part of the initial, at first we advertised it for everybody in the community and we had nobody responding. We had to target our advertising to certain employers and to certain demographics. And then the fun began because people said, oh, this is for me. And that's what we want to happen with all public health programs where they're targeted specifically to people who are in those health, those, those groups with health disparities. So not only good ideas, but also working together in partnership with other organizations and having a tangible work plan that will be evaluated over time. And so we have somebody we can hold responsible if things aren't changing fast enough for us. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the next, the next slide, please, Noni. So in public health, how many of you are familiar with this image? Oh, good, most of you. Well, this is a schematic, sure. This is a schematic that lays out the essential functions of public health. And for, for most of us, this is like, well, of course, this is what we do in public health. But if you're not in this field, you might just think that the public health department is make, harassing you about getting a COVID shot. Or they want your sewer to be inspected over and over again. And it's, it's not a positive um, it's not, not necessarily positive, but we hope we're gonna change that. And to describe this simply, it involves assessing the health conditions that exist in a community. And that's the beauty of public health. It doesn't work with one person, it works with a population. So it's assessing what, what's going on with this population and then developing policies and mobilizing community partners to figure out how can we address this most of you will have been exposed to a variety of public health campaigns over your lifetime. I worked in public health long enough that pretty much all of them at one point came within our um, work plans. But I'm going to use tobacco because I think that's the most obvious. And by the way, nutrition has recently taken over tobacco as the leading cause. Poor nutrition is the leading cause of death, of morbidity, and early mortality in the nation. So that fits in again to this agenda. But as far as tobacco goes, we had general programs right over everybody's head. When we targeted it, our tobacco programs for say pregnant women or families with young children, then we started getting some traction. We want even programs like tobacco to be focused on people with IDD. And the importance we had, um, we talked last night about an example that Stacy had been involved in, in making dental care and dental preventive health appropriate for people with IDD because some of the messaging was just off base. Well, the same thing goes for tobacco. When we check with people with IDD, the smoking levels are way low, like 6%. It's very low but we look at all people with disabilities, it's higher than the general population. So we have to pull out our target group, find out what their tobacco related issues are. And what we found out, 38% of the population that we surveyed is exposed daily to secondhand smoke. So that's the target message that we need to give to people with IDD and, and their caregivers and the environments they live in. Same thing goes with 
involving people with IDD and nutrition programs. We have to target the advertising and the promotion so they recognize that this has to do with their health and that the programming will be appropriate. So um, I kind of mentioned the other issue about why is equity important? If we, focus, if we don't focus on the groups and the demographics that have high health disparities, then, so we say, 10% of the population is afflicted by this condition, but 50% of people with a certain demographic are afflicted. So they get buried in those numbers and we don't recognize that they may have a unique way of having to work with them and they may have a unique need for different services. So equity in public health, as you can see on the schematic, used to be research. And our, our idea was that, well, if we do research and we'll put the, the data out there, everybody will respond. Well, we've come to learn, and um, you'll hear from Tom Quaid, he was instrumental in helping get this center of the public health activities switched from research to equity, because recognizing that business about health disparities bring the numbers down and affect the overall health in ways that we, we don't want to see if we're a compassionate nation that believes that everybody has a right to the justice of, a, of um, inclusive health. So thank you, Tom, and your colleagues, but it's now embedded. I can't imagine in my lifetime that's ever going to go, and I'm happy about it. Um, so we want people in public health to prioritize equity every step of the way. Chris mentioned how it's not, we, we can't think of it as optional. This is an expectation. If you're in public health, you're expected to serve the people with health disparities as well as the low-hanging fruit, which would be the general population. So to, to quote Chris again, does that make sense? Yeah, okay, thanks. Now, the basis, the cornerstone for, um, okay, the next thing I wanna mention is the US dietary guidelines. Have any of you heard that phrase before? Okay, you know, we don't just come up with recommendations like you should eat this and this will make you healthy. There's a whole massive body of science behind those recommendations. And in um, 1990, Health and Human Services and USDA were, were ordered by Congress every five years to re-examine the science behind food recommendations and to sort through what's evidence-based or what's, um, in truth, what's been promoted by a food industry. But to take the food industry issues out and talk about the science. Also coupled with that was recommendations need to jive with what's available agriculturally in our country. And I'll, I'll give you an example of how that influence goes two ways. It's not just make, make good for the farmers. It's what the farmers and ranchers had to do to help us achieve the US dietary guidelines. Some of these might sound familiar to you. Can, can most of you read those? No. Well, I'm gonna have a hard time too because I don't have, this is how big my image is here. But oh, here we go, I've got it on the screen. Thanks, Meg. Okay, the first is to follow a healthy dietary pattern at every stage of life. And of course that changes over time. And it's not prescribing a certain diet, like the Mediterranean diet. It's saying a dietary pattern that includes healthy foods and reduces unhealthy foods in the diet. The second one is to customize your food choices so that they're nutrient rich and culturally appropriate and things you like to eat. You know, it doesn't help me to think that squid is a very healthy source of iodine because I would, don't like squid. And so this is saying, go for the foods you like, but find within that, that group the things that are healthiest and consume those. The third dietary guideline is to focus on meeting the food group needs, and we all know what those are, but I can reiterate them for you if you don't. But the groupings of foods, like dairy is one grouping. Um, find those that have the most nutrient-dense foods and beverages and stay within the calorie limits. So how are we gonna stay within the calorie limits? The best way is portion sizes, but also to limit foods with added sugars, saturated fats, um, sodium, doesn't affect your uh, 
sodium doesn't improve our health, but we need a little bit, but certainly not what we're used to having. And reduce or avoid alcoholic beverages. So these do these sound familiar? Have you heard these messages being promoted through public health? Um, if you do, you have a good public health agency. So, uh, and I know that we hear them in Montana all the time. So then we say, okay, here's the guidelines. What's happening in America? And there's, um, oh, I forgot this one. This, these are the kinds of recommendations. When you have guidelines, they have to be, those are for professionals. And the, then they get translated into messages for the public. And this is how our USDA and Health and Human Services presents that information to the public. In 56, it was very simple. We had four food groups. I grew up in that era, and I remember every dinner my mom would say, this represents the four food groups, and you will eat all of it. And so we didn't know that there was a choice because we wanted to please our mom, and my mom wanted to please um, herself by saying she was following the government's directions. This came from the fact that the military, we had just gotten out of World War II, and there was a big recruitment for soldiers, but more than a third of the men who tried to get in the military were rejected because of malnutrition. That's how poorly our country was being fed. And so they took it upon themselves. They, the military pretty much initiated this process of coming up with guidelines. The other impetus was that out, coming out of the depression earlier on, farmers needed to have some support to grow products. And if they made a mistake and grew too much, they shouldn't have to absorb that as a loss. So the commodities programs got started. And there was a political reason behind all these programs, but they also served the, the health needs and the good of the nation, so they, were, they continued. Noni's going to go over all the different 17 programs, and you can see how familiar the, they are. They get more specialized over time, but they, they reflect the need to have a healthy population that can serve the military, which we have different views on, but... There, that still is an important aspect and a way to gauge whether or not the nation is, in truth, well-nourished with healthy foods. Okay, then we move to the Food Guide Pyramid, which focused on proportions of foods. And I'll tell you, this is where the food industry really got involved in recognizing that if they want to sell their products, they better try and fit them into the guide, guidance that the U.S. government's getting. Later on in the year 2005, the food pyramid changed and physical activity and the importance of it was added. Here's it also, but the, it got complicated and it was less f user friendly because it wasn't just a simple message. There were many more messages embodied. In fact, so complicated that there was probably as much time spent arguing about the content as there was actually learning from it. So now we move into 2011. The change here is my plate. Is there anybody here who hasn't seen or been exposed somehow to my plate? I didn't think so. So could any of you tell me what the what probably the primary message of my plate is as far as food recommendations? It's Pardon? Did, did you say uh, Half your plate should be fruits and vegetables. Absolutely. That is such a, such a significant message. And that's where the issue of not just helping farmers, farmers had to help us because a lot of math was done. And it turned out if we're recommending five half cup servings of fruits and vegetables a day, our farming industry produced enough for people to have one and a half servings a day. So they had to change some of their growing procedures to be, and their whatever what they were growing to be able to help us meet the dietary guidelines. So it's interesting that it comes full circle, but that that is the primary message. And the other food groups are important, and there's discussion about in in these excellent resource materials. If you go online, they talk about how to pick the highest nutrient dense foods within each of the food groups. So if you're a teacher or if you're running a nutrition program or trying to raise your family or you have friends, the more you delve into that my plate section on the internet, the more 
the more fun it is. It's really well done, and it's for all groups, all age groups across the um, life course. Okay, now I asked you if we could, or suggest that we need to figure out how we learn if the U.S. dietary guidelines are being followed by the American public, because it isn't good to just talk amongst ourselves. We have to see if they resonate with the public. So this, there's a healthy eating index, which is a metric that allows us to assess how close the public is to getting to those recommendations. The higher the score, as you can see, this is laid out by age group. The higher the score, the closer that age group, that demographic gets to eating the way it's, we're, we're recommending for, for maximum health. So, and the lower the score, the farther away they are from that, those standards that were in the four US dietary guidelines. So looking at this, which age group has the lowest score for eating healthy? Teenagers. Why do you think that is? Troublemakers, no. <laughs> yes, they're making independent decisions and they have discretionary funding and they respond to the food industry's promotion. And so this is an example. Yes, hi Stace, what you wanna know? Uh, junk food. Junk food? <laughs> What, you want to know more about junk food? Oh, yeah, that's the reason. Exactly, exactly. They're eating foods that are high in calories and low in nutrition with added sugars and too much fat, especially saturated fat. Yes. Okay. So the age groupings are two to four. 61, they, six, they get a score of 61 out of 100. Um, ages five to eight, it drops down to 55. And let me tell you, the advertising is profound to that age group. And you might not notice it if you're not watching TV at times when there's children's programming. It's different than what you'd see when you're watching adult shows. You don't see those ads. Okay, the next group is age nine to 13. They drop even further, 52% meet the standards. And then 14 to 18, 51, uh, not percent, 51 out of 100. So I guess you could call it a percent. They're not eating nutrient-rich foods. They're drinking soda pop instead of drinking milk. And they're eating at fast food restaurants three or four times a week instead of as a once a year treat, which some of us used to have. If you're old enough, you'll remember. We had one, one pop, we call it pop then. We could get one. Um, bottle of pop a year. And boy, we were so happy. But that was it. And those things, that's non existent right now. And if you don't think that advertising um, helps, I want to give you just one, one example. You know that phrase, everything in moderation? That was a Coke designed advertising slogan. They say it came from the Bible. I don't know. But everything in moderation means something totally different to everybody else. In a nutrition class we teach, we ask day one for all the students to write down what moderate alcohol consumption is in a week. And it goes from one drink to a six pack a day and beyond. It, it doesn't, it is without meaning, but it makes us feel good. And that's, that's the kind of influence advertising can have. It's a slogan that we use in our everyday life now. We even put it into the dietary guidelines. It doesn't, it is without meaning. Okay, to continue on that axis, ages 19 to 30, things start getting better. And I say they're older and they weren't exposed to the same advertising when they were growing up and they have different dietary habits. I might be wrong, but I think that's what it is. Ages 31 to 59, they rise up a little bit. What? Mm -hmm. 19 to 30 is 56. So they're reading about half the dietary guideline recommendations. This, yes. Um, I just thought I would, it seems like 19 to 30 also is an age when people are more image conscious. And so oh. then that kind of brings them into what they're eating and exercising. You're right? probably right on there. Yeah, that changes, you get, you get some maturity too, and hopefully some more critical thinking skills. Uh, the last group, why do you think the ages 60 and above are the highest 
score, but they're still only at 63. Why do they eat better than the rest of the population? Maybe so. Did you hear that? By then, they've already been diagnosed with chronic diseases, and their doctors are telling them they have to improve their eating habits. That's that's the consensus. That at that point, they've already realized their life is not going to go on forever. They may as well have a high quality of life, and they start making adjustments in their diets. And also, those folks have to make a lot of changes in their life. With aging comes different changes. And when I was a dietetic student. Um, and I was a little older than the rest of the people in the room. There was a statement about, well, we don't have to worry about their nutrition because they're old and set in their ways and they'll do whatever they want anyway. And I was like, no, I spent a lot of time with my grandma who's in her 80s and she's making a lot of changes because of those things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And they are people who are more willing right. to do that because they've got 20 years maybe and it's the end. And they're willing to, to put that effort forth to um, live the best life they can while they've got that time. Thanks. I love that. Uh, this is Meg Noni. Um, just, I love what you're saying. I think that too often when we think about transitions between, you know, leaving school and going into adulthood or, or retiring and getting ready for that next phase of your life, we think that it's so stressful. People can't handle messaging and support. Um, but it is exactly for motivational interviewing when we should be as public health and others providing support to people. It is those critical times where people are ready for change ready. and really organizing with them um, to, to be thinking about that next phase of life. Excellent, excellent thoughts. And this, this brings into focus the need to have targeted outreach because different groups have different needs and different perceptions and they're at different stages of readiness. So I'm just hoping all of us will be able to come up with uh, an understanding and it means having focus groups with people with intellectual disabilities or whatever target group we're working with and find out what is important to them so you can target the messages to them. Because the overall message is we want to improve our health and maintain good health if possible. Okay, this next slide just gives an overview of the kinds of strategies that the public health nutrition programs use to deliver their services. And we're, ha we're lucky that they go from the, the entire life course. There's something available for everyone, and they're targeted to improve health, but there's different ways that those services are delivered. So these are some, um, Noni and I worked to figure out if, what's the commonality in some of these programs. Some of them are, focus on community gardens and sustainable gardening and producing your own food or buying it locally rather than having it imported when, where there's lots of um, pesticides, herbicides, uh, preservatives. But if you buy it, if you grow your own food, you know what's in it. So you'll have opportunities for health. Second grouping of activities have to do with how do you select healthy foods? That means the tedious process of reading labels and ingredient lists, and then learning what the healthy things are. You don't have to do it every time you go in a store, but you do have to compile some information and retrieve it so you can make sure you're making the healthiest choices and the nutrition education programs. The third area have to do with food security, distribution, food distribution and access. And that's where a program like, you know, I mentioned that the dietary guidelines are the cornerstones of the food and nutrition programs, except for SNAP. SNAP is the one program a person can get an EBT card if they're eligible, and they can buy whatever foods they choose. On, and you hear a lot of criticism about, well, I saw what that person bought with SNAP. Well, it's really none of your business. Your business would be to role model good behavior and to share information with people who are interested and try to change the peer pressure to go for the healthier foods. Food safety is a big topic and important as we teach cooking classes because that's the beauty of processed foods. It's so full of preservatives. I have a box of potato um, dehydrated dehydrated potatoes from 1972 and I'm saving it because I want to prove I want my kids to see 
when I'm no longer around, I want them to see that they can produce the same product because it's so preserved that it's not going to it's not going to deteriorate. So, but we want to teach food safety because that's part and parcel of cooking and enjoying food. Um, then there are classes and opportunities for meal planning and meal preparation. And luckily, we have some FNEP. Um, Jackie's going to be here sharing information with you, and she's an expert in delivery of cooking classes for people with intellectual disability, blind and low vision people. And so if you're interested in how do you adapt your program, you don't have to change the, the content, but you change how it's delivered and change how it's marketed. Um, so, and then there's additional resources like breastfeeding promotion and diabetes prevention or programs that focus on prevention or treatment of chronic diseases. So the, this is kind of the um, schematic. It covers the lifespan. Some are delivered remotely, like um, Mallory was talking. Oh, you, you'll hear from when she talks about Special Olympics, but they found that a lot of the education, including cooking classes, go over super well. You reach a broader audience if you do it remotely. I learned the first nutrition program I was ever exposed to was FNEP, and that was in 1971. And that's where they used the coffee club and Tupperware model, where they would go into people's houses and the women would bring all their, their women friends and their sisters, and then they would have a basic cooking class. And it was so social. I thought, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. This is what I want to do. Then I went into the WIC pilot program. Same thing. This is the most exciting thing I've ever seen. I can help change lives of pregnant women and their infants and children, and I'm going to love it. And it, I'm using that as an example, because if you go into public health, and if you are that kind of a person who wants to make the world a better place, you're going to be trapped. So you better learn to enjoy it and, and figure out how to have successes in helping people plan their nutrition. Um, but all of them, this is how we deliver it, but they're all designed to improve health. So now Noni to talk to you about these 17 programs that we're referring to. Sure. OK, can you hear me OK? All right, I, uh, so um, next slide, Mary, next slide. She's got to get her turn in because I've been doing that for the whole slideshow. <laughs> All right, so you have this handout um, in your packet, and this is a picture of the handout um, that you, um, yours is on the, is this way, but it should be this way, and um, we, I think we're breaking some rules here because, um, just a second. Um, it has a lot of links in it, and that's because there's a lot of information about all of the 17 programs. I do need to make a point. Um, <clears throat> SNAP doesn't have the, um, the my plate the my plate attached to it, but it does have SNAP Ed, and that's where people on SNAP get their education and their information about that. And I'll say that because not every community can have FNEP and SNAP Ed, um, and I think they're both super programs, but that's because Caitlin Sharp is our SNAP Ed person in Blackfeet, and I love her dearly. So um, as you look at your handout, you see that we've organized it according to community garden, gardens, healthy uh, food selection and nutrition education down in that first column as you go down the far right of the page. And um, food security and distribution. And we've kind of put the programs under those focuses so that you can kind of see what they're emphasizing. Food security, distribution, and access. There's quite a few of those programs there. Let me look at this. OK. Good, you fixed it because my handout was wrong. <laughs> um, food safety is next. OK. Um, and then meal preparation is your expanded food nutrition and um, supplemental nutrition assistance program education, which is SNAP-Ed. And then the chronic disease are the two that are at the bottom. OK. So I'm, what I'm interested in to know um, is who in our audience presently works for or has been in a federally, federal food and nutrition program before. If you're employed there, stand up, please. Sorry? No, I'm just asking for people that work in the programs. 
If you work in a federal food and nutrition program right now or have ever, please stand up. There you go. Okay. Um, so if you want to kind of yell out which programs you work in, Jackie. FNEP and SNAP. FNEP and SNAP. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Haley. I work at uh, Montana Team Nutrition through Montana State University, which is a federal program, and then we carry out the grants in Montana. Yay, Team Nutrition. When I was a public health nutritionist, we worked with them a lot. Um, I am currently working in the WIC program, Billings, Montana. What's your name? Lisa. Linda. Lisa. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Elena Shapiro. I'm a dietitian and I work in WIC in Missoula. WIC in Missoula. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Sharp and I am the SNAP Ed instructor on the Blackfeet Reservation. Hi, I'm Rebecca Morley and I worked in public health nutrition, a community based program. And I'm Jackie Denegri, um, and I work with FNEP and SNAP in Kentucky. Okay, thank you guys. So if you want to go ahead and be seated, if you want to know more about these programs, um, you know who to ask now for the people that we have represented here. And um, Rebecca, when you said community-based program, was that a federal food and nutrition program? Well, part of it was sponsored, I think. Microphone, microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Part of the program was sponsored by federal money through grants. Okay, cool. Cool. Yes. Okay. Um, so then the next one is, I want you to stand if you or a family member of yours has ever participated in a food and nutrition program, federal food and nutrition program, please stand. If you or a family member. Okay, not very many. Oh, they're coming up. They're coming up. All right, and if you're not sure, if you have a child who's been a part of the National School Lunch Program at school, um, you should be standing up because that is one of the programs. Oh, we got a couple more. Okay. Or raise your hand. Or If you can't stand, yeah. you can raise your hand, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so we, we know that one in four Americans participate in federal food and nutrition programs. And also that many of the programs are income-based. And so um, I don't know that we'd have a whole lot of people in this room standing up. But also, there are some people who rely on that income. They may be 50 cents short of qualifying. And so they're still hungry. And they can't use that program. And that's when they come to places like Fast Black Feeds Pantry, because we take anybody who comes to the door. We are a GAP program. And we do promote um, eating balanced diets, things like that, using the MyPlate. And we organize our um, shopping area, our pantry, as people go through and shop with their carts and um, organize it according to the food groups. So indirectly, they're being educated about what those food groups are and what they can select for the size of their family. Marissa, raise your hand. This is Marissa um, Bremner, and she is the manager of our growing health program. So at Fast Black Feet, we, have, we look at providing food access. We provide nutrition education so people can eat healthy. We don't just give them food. Um, and we are also doing food sovereignty and helping people learn how to grow traditional plants and teaching them what they are at Blackfeet. So we have a, um, Fast Blackfeet is not just a food pantry program. It is a well-rounded program. And I am the board chair. I am not a staff person. I'm one of the original founders. I'm here actually representing the Blackfeet Inclusive Health um, Delegation. So when I came back from Washington, D.C., I just called people to the table. Caitlin and I pulled them in, and we have monthly meetings. We're trying to identify people in our community who have IDD. We are trying to identify services that they can or should be accessing and having the two meet. And so we are also training our delegate members and 
moving forward. And it's kind of a slow process, but that's how we started Fast Blackfeet. And we are over a million dollar organization now. Uh, Meg has a question. I just want to say um, I'm not on social media very often, but I did get to be in Washington, D.C. with Noni and Kashana from Fast Black Feet. And if you are on Instagram, I want you all to know how fabulous Fast Black Feet's content is. So all you need to do is go on to Instagram. This is something Kashana helped me do over lunch because I am a Luddite. <laughs> and uh, it's fantastic. The content um, that the work that you guys are doing, uh, and I just wanted to, to share that, uh, play that forward for everybody to, if you're on Instagram, um, it's a lovely positive, um, message and, and activities to, to be bringing into your stream of consciousness through social media. So it's fast black beat. Yeah. Thank you, Meg. Fam family is very important in indigenous communities. And Fast Black Feet is a family. We take care of our staff. We take care of our community. And we, we, we work hard to be honest and um, stand by our commitments. And uh, so they, the people there are so wonderful and hardworking. They just make my heart proud because it was a dream, a dream that I had a long time ago. Um, so as you can see, for various reasons, people with IDD don't typically participate in the federal food nutrition programs. Um, there was research done with an inclusive health project that interviewed people with IDD and indicated that almost 100% of those interviewed did not or had not ever participated in a nutrition program outside of school meals. Okay, so our, our programming has a ways to go. And I think part of it is that many of us, and I'm saying us, people like Caitlin work kind of in the communities day to day. And so what advertising she can do, what training she can do um, for herself is in that local base. But there are people at different levels at the state, at MSU, who actually make the decisions about what's going to happen. And there are plans made two or three years in advance and they're kind of locked in. So we're talking about a process here that started maybe here, continued next year, but then continues on, and sometimes with a lot of, of hard work for our local folks. Um, okay, so let's talk about some ways that uh, federal food nutrition programs can become more inclusive. And I think that's, I think it's your turn. <laughs> One more comment I just wanted to make it for Montana. You know, we talk about the federally funded nutrition programs and they're underutilized. This is a dollar amount. For Montana, in the WIC program, we served 9,000 uh, different people during the year, and that was the average monthly caseload, but 18,000 are eligible. And that translates into a loss of $7 million for Montana a year. And then you look at the SNAP program, they have a lot better participation. It's 82% of those eligible, but because they have such a huge program and bigger um, health benefits, that translates into that 20% that aren't participating is another $44 million that Montana turns back. And we're expecting, I guess, expecting our community-based programs to pick up that dollar amount. It's not possible. But if we, and I know a lot of food banks promote the referrals and they try to help people get into and engage with the federal programs, but it behooves us to do this not only for our economy and our farmers, but most importantly for the people that could benefit, have health benefits from participating. So we've heard that between one and 3% of the population experience an intellectual developmental disability. Uh, other research from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system shows that 14% of Americans identify with having a cognitive disability. So it's really important for us to think about how our delivery of these nutrition programs are inclusive. And it goes back to the question that was asked earlier. Um, and for thinking about the nutrition security what that means for everyone 
would be to have consistent and equitable access to healthy, safe, affordable foods essential to optimal health and well-being. And the FFNPs are instrumental in accomplishing this task. So this is just a quick overview of some things to digest about how to make inclusive delivery and programming. Uh, an inclusive approach to tackling these food nutrition insecurities includes targeted outreach. No, you're good. <laughs> to provide well-stated instructions and examples, making your classes as predictable and structured as possible by starting and ending each class with the exact same discussion or activity, posting a schedule of the classes and each class agenda so everyone knows what to expect, and then providing a cognitive interpreter to provide a reminders of the task at hand, using a graphic booklet on the day's activities with color-coded handouts, props, and objects for activities, offer instructions with pictures, or use hand gestures to describe activities, so multiple ways that people can access the information, and then ask questions to learn if participants understand and can apply what is taught. So this is a, a teaser for my talk that'll be tomorrow morning about universal design and inclusive delivery of the programming. So just to think about planting that seed and ways that we can do that and really access the audience that we're intending. So for uh, timing on this, Mary, can you give me um, an update on math on how you want the group activity to go? Okay. So we would love to have you all get together to be able to discuss some of the, the topics that have generated your thoughts so far today. And we're gonna break into three groups to be able to do that. Um, the first group, is for those of you all that are looking to identify and address the challenges enrolling in a food assistance um, program. So speaking from your experiences, describe what you hear from others and what kind of solutions you propose. So if that's group one, if that's something that you wanna talk about. Is that, yeah. It's way too much. Oh, okay. You wanna, okay. Yeah, initially we, um, there was a plan to have you choose your groups, but in an effort of time and structure of the room, we're gonna assign the groups, that's what I'm being told. So um, so maybe staying at your tables versus getting to mingle is what you're thinking? I think that's a great idea. Yeah. This is also a really great example of being flexible and adaptable in making things successful for your delivery. So with only eight minutes left, we're going to talk through this as a group about, uh, yeah, we're working in one big group today. So our first question, I just read through, through that prompt. So if there's anybody in the room that can identify those challenges, maybe through your experience or individuals that you support, if you'd raise your hand, we'll get the mic to you and we can have a great discussion. Um, when I'm from, oh, sorry. My name is Diana. I am the Flathead Lincoln County Corner Coordinator for Summit Independent Living. And I am a middle-aged white woman with blonde hair. And I, one thing I experience in my area is transportation barrier. Um, and then the second thing I experience is the person's apply, they've gone online, they've applied for SNAP, and then they get this letter and it says, we want to see A, B, and C. Show us your bank statements. Show us your rental agreement. And then that is a process, especially um, people who have certain disabilities that are preventing them from maybe even waking up to deal with this stuff. And so that's one problem that I see I could go on for an hour but in to keeping it brief uh transportation barrier and then the proofs uh, barrier trying to get those and provide those Hi, my name is Jean Morgan, and I'm the executive director with Spring Meadow Resources in Helena. And we, 
um, as um, service providers, we recently have experienced a loss of the commodity services for people that support folks um, that live in the community. And so it's been a, a huge impact for 50 years. Um, you know, programs such as ours were eligible to receive those services and they are not anymore. So it's a huge impact on our budget, obviously, and on some of the access uh, to for people that live in our supported living program or that kind of thing. So I'd be interested to know a little bit more about how do we, where do we go now and how do we turn that around? So thank you. Anybody have any thoughts on solutions to that or similar experiences? How did the, why was it stopped? We all received letters that said that we were never eligible <laughs> after they took them 50 years to figure that out. But um, because we're not a food pantry, um, we're not eligible for those services anymore for the, for the food commodity program. Mm. I'll say we're, we're certainly not going to be able to answer these questions, but we're writing them down and we're asked to share them with the food and nutrition program directors in the state. So we're going to, that's a good question. Thank you. Oh, oh Nani's got the. Also, if you have solutions to some of these problems or ideas for solutions, those would be really good to bring up. And I'm thinking that in a case like that, um, I don't, I don't know all the administration of everything, but if it's anything that has to do with the state, know that we have a legislative session coming up. And if you can find allies or someone to write a bill who can, you know, Mm -hmm. And and that may be um, very naive of me, to be honest with you. I'm afraid of the legislature here. Mm. Oh, <laughs> it's Diana again. Um, I'm thinking about the processing time, not just for SNAP, but for Medicaid. And some of these uh, programs that are covered under Medicaid. I had a guy out of Sealy, 105 days, 105 days. And I still don't know whether he was approved for these programs, but that is excessive to me, that a person should be waiting more than three months, and they're clearly under the limits. So if somebody wants to say something about that, please. Um, you know, I don't understand what the problem could possibly be with processing these applications or it taking that long. Um, and I think uh, something, the other thing I was thinking is, um, when they're waiting for proofs, if somebody's, maybe we can give them some SNAP, a little bit of SNAP, and then instead of shutting their application down or saying, no, you didn't show us your rental agreement, so go on and be hungry for a while until you can handle that. And so I think a different approach would be helpful. Yeah, I, I was, um, I, I just wanted to share so the Developmental Disabilities Council um, had a conference and during a session on Medicaid, we heard from many advocates and family that, you know, the whole Medicaid redetermination process has been really hard, to <laughs> horrendous, as Re Re Rebecca just said. Um, and one of the things that came up was that there are 20 of our offices of public assistance with no staff currently in the state. Right. Um, and I just, that's just an anecdotal report that I heard during that session, but trying to get the right person to help you connect to the resource. Even today, the pandemic has really taken its toll on our public servants, um, whether they're in public health or working in that capacity. And, um, I think it's really hard, um, and I really love Diane, what you were saying, it almost sounds like we used to talk about housing first, you know, let's, let's get people nutrition that they need while we get them signed up for the long term program. Yeah. Mary. I, I, I just want to say, and I'm trying not to be um, politically inappropriate, but Montana's processes are different than other states. 
my sister moved here from Oregon and in that state they do just what you described where they give benefits until a decision's been made. They err on the side of care instead of punitive. And I think one, one thing that we can do as a group is to remember that these programs provide food that benefits our agriculture community and it helps our food systems be sustainable as the farmers are able to get money for the foods that they produce for us. That's something to, to, in, to interject into conversations with people who say, well, they shouldn't be on the programs. We shouldn't have the programs. I'd like to get rid of all the food and nutrition programs. Well, who's going, the farmers are the ones who are gonna suffer as well as the military, as well as the schools. So I think we have to get a little uh, smarter in our conversations. There's a, a national organization, some of you, if you're old enough, you'll remember, it's called FRAC. It's Food Research, Food Resource and something. Anyway, there, there are advocates and lob they lobby at, in Washington, D.C. for program rules in addition to setting the, the minimum standards that states can go down, down, down and making it more difficult. And so, you know, it might be that we reactivate. They're still there. We just haven't used them. Minky Medora, if you, any of you remember her, she was their uh, main feeder of information. And this, the kinds of things that you're talking about are exactly the things that they would tackle through state legislation, through national legislation. I'd like to thank everyone that uh, took the opportunity to share. I, I hate that we weren't able to do a, a larger group activity, but hopefully you can uh, allow these thoughts to ruminate our, during our time together and let these be opportunities as you're networking with others. Because really, truly, this is the beginning of connecting with each other and asking these questions and starting to think through the, the barriers and start talking about solutions. So we're excited to, to get started on that today. And with that, we're going to move on to the next thing on the agenda that I don't have in front of me. Okay, big round of applause. Yes, there are um, challenges and barriers that we we heard that we can, as, um, as we deliver our programs, be working with our self-advocates and our partners to, to, to make the programs more available, accessible, and meet the needs um, that individuals have. But we also have these big systemic barriers and opportunities to be working together on those. And um, tomorrow, uh, Diana's colleague, Travis Hoffman, who's an advocacy coordinator for independent living, is, is going to be here. And I want to bring forward the Developmental Disabilities Council in terms of trying to really organize with us for some of these big um, systemic things. Jean, thank you so much for bringing forward that change um, that you guys are experiencing. And I, I hope that during lunch, we can have some of those conversations, continue that networking. Um, we have a 10 minute break. And uh, I think lunch is being served as buffet style. Is that right? In, in here. So help yourself to food. Um, thank you so much, Noni and Mary, for working with Dining Services for some healthy nutrition options for us. And we have a special guest speaker for our lunch, Josh Slotnick, who is a champion for community gardens and inclusive community gardens. So we're going to be hearing from Josh uh, during lunch. So we, hey, there he is. Hi. Uh, so um, please um, take some time for yourself help yourself to some lunch, come back in and uh, we'll all get settled. And then um, Josh will provide a keynote presentation for us during lunch. I'm gonna look to Mackenzie and make sure we're not missing anything. Anything to add? We're good? 